Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the formation of imines and enamines. When amines react with aldehydes or ketones, they make either imines or enamines depending on the structure of the amine. So for instance, primary amine, like what I have here on the screen, going to make an imine, a compound with a carbon-nitrogen double bond. If, however, I take a secondary amine and I react that with a carbonyl, an aldehyde or a ketone, I am going to end up with an enamine, a molecule where I have a double bond which is going to be adjacent to the nitrogen and not directly on the nitrogen. Both functional groups are not particularly interesting on their own, however, they both have important uses in organic chemistry. Amines are typically intermediates in reductive amination, which is a synthesis of amines, while enamines, they are particularly useful as stable alternative to enolates, which gives you various carbon-carbon double bond formation reactions. Specifically, enamines are used in the stork enamine synthesis. And depending on your core structure, you might be covering the formation of enamines and enamines in the carbonyl chapter, or you might be seeing them in the amines chapter. Regardless where you are going to be talking about those in your course, enamines and enamines are must-know topic for the sophomore organic chemistry students, so you would need to know that for your finals for sure. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of these reactions, they're actually pretty easy and straightforward, and most interestingly, both reactions have an extremely similar mechanisms, that's why I put them together into the same video. The first thing that we are going to do here, we are going to take take our carbonyl, I chose a ketone in this case, and we are going to react with our amine. For the amine formation, I am going to be using the primary amine. That primary amine is going to do the nucleophilic attack on our carbonyl. Sometimes some instructors and a few textbooks will show the initial protonation of the oxygen over here, so that would be a positively charged oxygen rather than neutral one, although it's a little bit questionable whether this reaction actually goes through the initial protonation of oxygen or not, I'm going to opt for the neutral mechanism and then I will protonate my intermediate later on in the reaction. So once this nucleophilic attack happens, we are going going to end up with an intermediate, and now we need to get one of these hydrogens off our nitrogen, and we need to protonate our oxygen here. Typically, we are going to show that in two steps, first, some sort of a chaperone, maybe another molecule of my amine or something else, going to come by, pull that proton off, gives me the intermediate, which then gets protonated and gives me my halfway point intermediate, which is going to be the hemiaminal. Some instructors, however, do this uh, step sort of like in one step, showing the curved arrows like that. This is a common shortcut, however, it is conceptually incorrect, because this type of uh, interaction within the molecule intramolecular proton transfer would require a four-member transition state, and that just doesn't happen for proton transfers. So while some instructors do that, I'm going to opt for the option with the chaperone and do two proton transfers instead of one proton transfer. Now, next, when we have our hemiaminal, hemiaminal, just like hemiacetals, those guys are unstable, so that's not where we are going to stop our reaction. Our reaction is going to continue, and in order to continue our reaction, we need to take this OH group and we need to convert it into a good living group. The only way how we can do that is by protonating that. So we're going to have an H plus from the external source, uh, and this reaction is done in the presence of acid. We are going to add a little bit of acid, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But with this internal source of our H plus, we're going to protonate our OH group convert it into the corresponding living group, and that gives me a living group over here, which then can easily dissociate, giving me an aminium ion. Now, this aminium ion is not particularly stable because we have an extra charge on our nitrogen, so we'll have to get rid of this proton somehow. And in order to do that, we're going to use another molecule of myamine, or whatever else that you have floating around, pull that proton off, and we are going to get our amine, which is our final product, and I will remind you here one more time that amine is the molecule with the CN double bond. Now, as I've mentioned a moment ago, this reaction is catalyzed by a very small quantity of an acid, so typically we are going to show it as pH equals 5 and not even the real acid present. The thing is, 
a very small amount of asset here is quite strategic. Any larger quantity and then the amine that you have over here as a nucleophile, well, it's also a base, it's just going to get all protonated and we no longer have a nucleophile. And if we have not enough of our acid, then this extra acid won't be able to effectively protonate the OH and catalyze the formation of the living group that is required to uh, keep this reaction moving. So we need to hit this balance where we have just enough acid to be able to protonate our OH in the middle of the mechanism, but not too much acid so we don't protonate all of our nitrogens, rendering them useless for us. Now, when it comes to the enamine formation, well, mechanistically speaking, the enamine formation is exactly the same as the enamine formation, with the exception of the very last step. Here, I want to point out that in order to make an enamine, we are going to use a secondary amine, unlike in the case of the emine formation, for that guy we use the primary amine. So the first step here, just like in the previous case, is going to be the nucleophilic attack on our oxygen, giving us a double charge zwitter ionic intermediate, and then over a couple of proton transfer steps we are going to reach the same midpoint, which is our hemiaminal intermediate. Again, I am showing here the two proton transfer steps, I'm using the chaperone, although, as I've mentioned before, some instructors will do the shortcut where they will just show it like that intramolecularly, which, as I've mentioned, is unlikely to happen. Now, once we have our hemiaminal intermediate, the next thing, like in the previous case, is going to protonate our OH in order to make that into a living group. That living group is going to dissociate, giving us the aminium ion again. But here we have a problem. We no longer have a proton on the nitrogen that we can easily pull off and stabilize our molecule. So what are we going to do in this case? Well, in this case, we're actually going to use one of the nearby hydrogens on the carbon. Here, it doesn't matter where I use hydrogens on this carbon or if I use hydrogens on that carbon. Both of those are symmetrical, both of those are identical, so it really doesn't matter. If the molecule was not symmetrical, then you would potentially make multiple products. So, we are going to bring some sort of a base, anything with an electron pair that is floating in our uh, solution here, like another equivalent of our amine, for instance, pull that uh, nearby hydrogen off, and that's going to give us our in amine as our final product. So we are going to have our double bond next to our nitrogen and not on the nitrogen itself. So mechanistically speaking, both mechanisms are exactly the same, with the exception of the last step, which is going to be a little bit different in the case of the emine formation. The last step was pulling off the proton from the nitrogen. In the case of the enamine formation, the last step is pulling off the hydrogen from the nearby carbon rather than nitrogen. Now, one important thing that I want to mention about these reactions is that these reactions are equilibrium. Both enamine and emine formation, they are equilibrium, which means that we are typically going to favor the formation of the more stable product. This is going to be especially important in the case of non-symmetrical starting materials that can potentially give you multiple products and multiple different stereoisomers. So out of the entire soup of possible products, you should always be opting for the more stable product. So let me illustrate that with an example. So for instance, let's look at this reaction over here. Here I have the primary amine, my nitrogen is only connected to one carbon, and I am reacting with an aldehyde, and of course I have pH 5, which means that I have a slightly acidic conditions here. So, as a result of this reaction, I am going to make a C and double bond. But here is a problem. My C and double bond can have either the E stereo configuration or it can have a Z stereo configuration. In this case, in the E product, my two bulkier groups are further apart from each other, so they are not going to be experiencing much of the steric hindrances of any sort. On contrary, in the case of my Z product, I have two of my bulky groups relatively close to each other, which is going to cause steric hindrances and steric interactions, which is not thermodynamically stable. So in this case, the E product 
product is going to be our major product and not the Z product simply due to the sterics. Likewise, if I look at the formation of the enamine, for instance, now I am reacting my aldehyde with the secondary amine, and I know that this is a secondary amine because my nitrogen is connected to one and two carbons, well, in this case, I am going to end up again with two different possible products, but now it's going to be a carbon-carbon double bond rather than carbon-nitrogen double bond. So, like in the previous case, I do have some steric interaction over here in the Z product, and I don't have any steric interactions over here in my E product because my uh, bulky groups are further away from each other. Because of that, my E product in this case is as well going to be the major product. So, as you can see, the formation of amines and enamines is a very straightforward reaction with a very simple mechanism. Well, maybe not that simple, but, you know, in comparison. And as I've mentioned earlier, it's rarely going to be the final product in this reaction that's going to be really important to us, but these amines and enamines are going to be intermediates in the multi-step synthesis, so we're definitely going to see them in the future more than once. I'll talk more about the uses of enamines and enamines in a different tutorials, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future updates. Thank you for watching, hit the like button if you learned something new today, check out this video next, and I'll see you next time!